DC Mayor Mariel Bowser announced a new DC pilot program on Monday that will spend nearly $25 million, including through gifts of up to $10,000 in cash to help 600 low-income DC families find stable housing. In addition to the cash, available benefits include rent and career support and a recurring deposit of $200 in a savings account for every month a family pays their portion of the rent. Mayor Bowser explained that some residents enrolled in government assistance programs face a dilemma when choosing jobs if the new earnings are less valuable than the benefits they receive from the government. She referred to this as the benefits cliff. The Career Mobility Act plan is aimed at helping families who are transitioning out of homelessness but do not require permanent housing vouchers. According to Bowser, quote, we are creating a new program that helps fill that gap. Mm. So, Robbie, you know, how do you feel about this? Well, look, I am happy to hear some acknowledgement that it can be the case that you can have a welfare policy so generous that it disincentivizes people from, um, you know, pulling taking care of themselves or getting housing or getting jobs or whatever it is because the program itself is so generous. That's exactly what well, I don't know that Bowser is saying. The argument, the argument isn't that the programs are so generous, but that when they have a cliff, instead of kind of titrating out over time, the incentives sure. can be that it's better to take the social benefit and not, and also be able to stay right. home from work, be with the kids, not have to pay for childcare, then earning $10, $100, $1,000 even more, but then not having to pay for all of the loss of those benefits. So one of the criticisms of welfare reform in the 90s under Bill Clinton was that he changed welfare from a program that was used for people to get back on their feet and was very effective as a program that people could use as they were in school, as they got you know, the credentialing that they needed to get the kinds of different kinds of jobs to making it a work required program that created these kind of incentives where, especially for working mothers, you know, given the childcare mm -hmm. costs, having to work while you did the other things that were supposed to be getting you on your feet really made it a difficult financial decision for you. Well, and unhoused p uh, families are probably uh, an easier uh, situation to address, or, or there will probably be a higher likelihood of success, I would think, mm -hmm. addressing the, this it, their issues with something like this because they're probably more likely to just have fallen on hard times or have some situation, and they have incentive, right, they have a you have a family unit, you have people to take care of. It, it's not the same or is probably not always the same or as closely related to the kind of, you know, drug addiction, mental illness problem that we're seeing in a lot of Although, these cities. There are, I mean, there are mentally ill people who have families and people who struggle with addiction who have families as well. I do think it's I mean, more I presume when they're talking about families, they're talking about kids as well in the mix. Um, yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately yeah. a lot of people's parents have drug addiction and mental health issues as well. I mean... Well, I, okay, but if they're... Uh, if they're homeless and their parents are drug addicts and mentally ill, I mean, then, and I'm the most reluctant to call child services for any reason, but then, I mean, that is the point at which you, you have them taken for to foster care, right? I mean, well, no, I mean, there's lots of people who are affluent whose parents also have uh, substance abuse issues and uh, mental illness, and their kids aren't taken away. You know, this is part of the issue with poverty and homelessness and these cycles of abuse is that, homes. well, yeah, when, when problems become visible, suddenly the state intervenes. And the conditioning of whether or not the state intervenes, I would argue, shouldn't be on the basis of whether or not someone is rich or poor, but about whether you think there's an underlying harm to kids. And so, you know, I, 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 this is when people talk about, for example, police being called disproportionately on folks that live in apartment buildings and lower income folks, generally speaking, because if you have a fight, and so your neighbor's more likely to call you if you live in an apartment, call, you know, to call the police if you're in an apartment versus in a standalone home. Now, if there's abuse going on and there's a fight, I would say the police or whomever should be involved, regardless of if you're rich or poor. But, you know, these situations create disproportionate policing on low-income people and how to how to untangle that and make sure that people are helped who need help but aren't criminalized because of their poverty status is part of the ongoing concern of a lot of criminal justice but that advocates. Is, right. But that's a great example of something can be disproportionate but still, like the like to make it to fix it, you would make it proportionate by having more policing on the other community too, not necessarily less policing on the community in question. Or you know, have interventions that don't involve the police. So are you know people struggling to get out of abusive relationships? Are they encountering, encountering these kind of housing issues as mm -hmm. they try to get away? Is that part of why they're staying in these relationships? You know, those are the kinds of things we'd like to untangle. So I do think this is, to your point, a more sympathetic group because there are children involved. Um, but you know, we'll we'll see. Well, my, my point was a, a group whose issues are more easily addressed with actual cash payments is what I would say. Perhaps.
perhaps. All right. Meanwhile, Los Angeles has experienced a 4% increase in its homeless population during the pandemic, with over 69,000 unhoused people counted across the country this year, according to The Guardian. But the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, which conducted the count in February of this year after skipping a year during the pandemic, said the growth of the unhoused population had slowed in the last two years, in part due to pandemic programs and increased social funding. So the previous count conducted in January 2020 showed a 13 percent jump from uh, 2019 and of course we had a guest on the show last week who was arguing in that one of these um, kind of homelessness poverty debates we've been having uh, was arguing that a, a lot of the based on his understanding his actual conversations with unhoused people in California that many of them do have homes they can go to they have families they have people who have beds for them bedrooms for them but they can't because of their, the real issue is, is drug addiction because they're going to have an episode and they need to be, they need to be on Skid Row. They need to be you know, where, where the tents are, where the drug dealer is so they can get access to drugs. And that's really what prevents him, uh, prevents those people from being, being they, they have home, we, we don't need to throw homes at, I mean, it would always be better to have more homes and to allow more housing to be built, but then, a, but then, a, Addressing the drug addiction is the main issue. Yeah, that was Layton Woodhouse making that argument. And so we, what we came up with is that there were two issues here. One, you obviously can't kind of frog march people at gunpoint back to their parents' houses if they're struggling with addiction. So the question is, are there resources available to help people with these addiction services? And I think both guests agree that there really were not. So again, I think we kind of keep having these homelessness conversations that talk past each other where people say, oh, well, you know, the real issue isn't homelessness or the real issue isn't this, that, and the other. People have homes, like all of these are kind of missing the point. Oh, everybody agrees that there's an addiction problem that many people have that's at the root of their homelessness. Are we going to do something about that? And the real tension there was, does a housing first plan um, kind of require housing before the addiction is taken care of. And again, there's a little bit of slippage there because it's like, if you want someone to have addiction services and there aren't addiction services, are you then there, then saying that the person should be living in the street and in Skid Row? And if that's the solution, then that's the solution. But then you have a bunch of other people complaining about the optics of Skid Row and we go round and round and round in a circle. And round and round we will continue to go, likely, because this is an issue that uh, really frustrates and perplexes a lot of people and one we have a lot of interest in and we'll continue to discuss on the show. And we'll have more Rising right after this.